911, what's the nature of your emergency? <laughs> Good morning, police, fire, military, and families, and to everybody who is listening in on the Talk to the Living podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Walton, and today I am joined with a very famous Mr. Gray, and I am so sorry, ladies, it is not that one. However, this one is much, much more real. Mr. Quentin, how are you this morning? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us. You are actually 12 hours into the future coming to us all the way from China. I think you are probably um, the furthest away guest that we've ever interviewed on our show. So thank you. It's sometimes difficult and confusing to coordinate times and things like that, but I'm super excited for this interview and I'm very grateful that you're spending time with us this morning. Oh, thank you for having me. I can't wait. Me either. So if we can start, I'm going to kind of dive right into it. I know you're a former FMF corpsman and you call yourself the public health guy. And besides living in China, can you kind of take us back a little bit and talk to us a little bit about how you got into service in the first place? Oh, wow. Um, I kind of fell into the whole thing, to be honest with you. It, it, it was I, I come from a military family, but for being quite a big military family, we don't have any like career people within our family, but my father mm -hmm. served my, my grandfather, my cousin, uh, uncles on both sides. And, um, yeah, I, I kind of wasn't doing anything. And uh, I was 22 at the time. I was like, well, I better do something. And that's kind of how I got in. I just kind of raised my hand and said, well, I got to do something because I'm not doing much right now. So where did the medical component of it come in for you? You know, the funny thing is, is when, when, I, when I joined, I originally looked at the Air Force. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what what branch I wanted wanted to go into. And and um, when I took the ASVAB test, I was offered a few jobs and I was kind of like, ah, you know, they're mechanic jobs. I'm not very good with my hands. And uh, then I saw this thing that says Corman on it. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And then I looked at the recruiter and he's like, yeah, yeah, that one, that one. <laughs> and so really, that's how I did. That's how I did that. And I remember actually, I was working for the U-Haul company at the time, and uh, I went back and um, told a guy that I work with, and he was a former Marine. He's like, "Oh, dude, you're gonna end up with the Marines." And I'm like, w "Why would I end up with the Marines, man? I just joined the <laughs> Navy." And and uh, funny enough, uh, that the rest is history. I ended up uh, staying uh, Marine side or what we call Green side for about eight years. So I served in about uh, five different Marine Corps units as wow. an F FMF Corman. Wow. How long was that? From 1999 to uh, 2007. Oh, wow. Uh, thanks for your service. My front porch light is on green. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm guessing that's Brian K. Bishop. If it is, go ahead and make sure that you grant StreamYard permission to see your name. That way I can see all of your obnoxious comments coming through. <laughs> now, Quentin, I know that you are living in China. So why are you still living in China being an American? Uh, I've actually been overseas now for, I think, about 18 years. Um, I spent about four years in Japan with the service. And um, when I got out, I decided to EAS in, um, in 06, I EAS. And my last duty station was Japan at a, a place called, if you have any Marines in, in the audience, uh, Camp Fuji, Japan, um, where I was the second top medical medical guy there on the base and the preventive medicine tech for the base, as well as the uh, base EMT, lead EMT, that is. And um, I, I just, uh, it got time to get out the service. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I did know that I enjoyed living in Japan a lot. And at that time, I uh, I, I met a girl in 2002 and, and um, uh, you know, right before I went overseas to, to fight in the Iraq war. And she sent me a bunch of great little boxes of goodies and she's from Macau originally. So, you know, being in Japan, we would spend a lot of time together. And I said, you know what, I'll just go over to Macau for a little while. I thought I'd be here two, two years, three years. I didn't have any plans. I didn't, I didn't say I'm going to end up getting married to this girl. I didn't, you know, I didn't have anything set out and it just happened. And, and I've been stuck here um, and not really stuck here because I love it. it. It goes up and down. It's kind of a love hate sometimes, but, it, but uh, it's a beautiful city. I, I've been here for almost 14 years now. I think it'll be 14 in February. If, if I'm correct. 
Wow. It's been quite a long time. And my daughter was born here and I've got two dogs here and, you know, it's just a normal life. I'm, I miss the States. The States is home. I'm, I'm an American by, by blood, sweat and tears always. I, I, I love America and I go home once a year. And at some point in my life, I'd probably, um, I'd like to get back. Um, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it and I get to travel. I mean, I travel all the time and being here, it's so cheap and so fast. I, I've been all over Asia. I mean, Southeast Asia, Asia, China, you name it. I've been there just probably more or less um, a few places I haven't been to, but, but um, so I do like that. I like that aspect and, and, and I'm a photographer. So it, uh, you know, if I did live in the States right now, it would be very expensive for me to be able to travel to the places that I travel now. So yeah, absolutely. Good morning, you guys. And yes, Mr. Brian, definitely better. Where is home, Quentin? Home is Dallas, Texas. Born ah, yeah. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. So I know that you have this incredible this incredible experience when it comes to um, just medicine in general. You can definitely tell that. And one of our first really deep interactions was you kind of educating me on the wave of the coronavirus as it had hit you know, you had went through that yeah. as, as we were about to. So can you talk a little bit about your experience with what you've done in terms of being in the medical field? Yeah, I started out as a corpsman and, uh, you know, just basic corpsman and first duty station was Okinawa and I was, I worked a lot in admin and I didn't do a lot of medicine and then got back to Camp Pendleton, California, where I started getting a different units. I was with the 11th Mu and, you know, got sent to a bunch of different trauma classes, combat trauma management courses and, uh, pre-hospital trauma life support and, and and all this cool stuff and um and then uh, I, I didn't go on that 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 deployment with that unit I, it was 11th mu and uh, some things happened and, and, and I got off the deployment which was kind of it, it was kind of um, perfect in a way because um I, I think I ended up where I needed to be and I ended up in a new unit um, at that time um, before the Iraq war kicked off called a shock trauma platoon and so um I, I got with that unit and I went over and, and took Baghdad in 03 with the, with the 11th and the seventh Marines and, and, um, you know, the army guys and did that. And, um, I really didn't really get into, I got into preventive medicine after Iraq. I, I went to a six month school for that. Um, I, I kind of knew I was probably going to get out of the service. Um, I didn't know when, but I, I wanted to set myself up with a, what we call a C school and, and, and be a little bit more focused on one area and, and not, just trauma is mm. predominantly is what we do as corpsmen, uh, especially during wartime. We do a lot of, you know, sick call things and stuff in, in, in garrison and, and back home and stuff. But um, so then, yeah, I went to six month school for preventive medicine and I went to um, Camp Fuji, Japan after that. And I ended up being the um, preventive medicine technician for the entire base of about 200 people. Uh, it's a training base. So um, uh, about 200, 200 personnel um, that were permanent there. And then we would, get uh, training units from Okinawa that would come over and do their training to get ready to go over to Afghanistan and go over to Iraq. And, and, um, I had a really good mentor, a really good, uh, first class, uh, independent duty corpsman who I'm still friends with nowadays. He ended up going all the way to E8 and, and got out of the Navy and, um, we still talk and stuff. And, um, uh, and, um, I learned a lot from, from him medically and, and as a leader, a lot of leadership stuff from him as well. You have such a unique, situation. Good morning. Um, and I'm just, my mind is going wild because I haven't ever um, considered this with you before, but a lot of people that are getting out of the military and they're making that transition back into civilian life, they come back to the comforts of their own home a lot of the times. And for you, you, you didn't do it that way. So can you talk a little bit about that transition? Yeah, it, it, it was difficult because I, I, I can still remember too being in Camp Fuji and, um, and, and that was by far my I had so much fun at that, that duty station three years. It, it was the best time I learned so much, but uh, it was difficult because I didn't really want to leave, but I knew it was time. So I was kind of dealing with two things. I was dealing with leaving a place that I really like and I felt comfortable with and very spiritual, but then also the unknown of, you know, seven years of my life, almost eight years of my life and then changing. And it, it was pretty easy in the sense, because I did it really quickly. I came home, I, I was home, after I separated out of the military, I was only home for about 20 days, and then I flew back over to Asia. Um, so I kind of had to jump right into it. It, it did take me a long time um, to adjust to being a civilian, probably about uh, two years, if not three years. Mm -hmm. It really was tough. And I don't know if that had anything to do with 
not being in the United States and being here um, or not, but it, it was a tough tan- transition. And, and I think um, a, a lot of people do struggle with that. And, and, and for people that are getting out, you know, uh, just know that it will take time because you have to almost rewire your brain. Yeah. What did your, your family, everybody back home think about you permanently leaving and moving to Asia? Well, my father, my father travels a lot. He's been around, he's been in 80% of the countries in the world and uh, he's wow. lived in, he's lived in two. He lived in Kiev. He speaks fluent Russian and he lived in uh, Cairo for four years in Kiev and two. And so I think he wasn't really surprised. I've, I've kind of um, done a lot of things that he has too. And so it wasn't really anything new. You know, I don't really know because no, we never really sat down as a family and anybody, we didn't discuss it. Um, so I, I mean, outwardly it was, Okay, you know, I mean, I've been gone for so long already. Um, I left home at the age of 22. Um, I got out of the service um, at the age of 30. So um, I, I don't think it was too difficult for, for most people um, within the family. Um, you know, c- cousins kind of raised their eyes a little bit and like, huh, what are you doing? But the immediate family was kind of like, yeah, okay. That's great. You you kind of gently brushed over the spirituality component of um, what comes when we're exposed to other cultures. And I just wondered if maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, well, Japanese culture, for one, is, is very, very spiritual. Um, Japan itself is a very spiritual place when you're there. You just kind of you really feel it. Um, Macau, Macau is very spiritual as well too. It, it, it's quite different than Japan. Um, you can't um, really uh, look at this, look at the two in the same way. Um, Chinese culture. I, I haven't really been around a lot of Chinese culture in the sense of w- what I think we we feel of Chinese culture as far as um, being from you know on the mainland side. Um, Macau is quite different just because of. Uh, it used to be Portuguese colony. And, and so it's very, very much of a, a European influence here. Um, the building, the food, um, you know, so it's, it's a very, very big mix of cultures here. You've got Portuguese, you've got the Chinese, you've got the mixture of the Chinese and the, and the Portuguese. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it, it's a really different dynamic here than other places I've been to, but it's, it, it's palpable. You know, you, you walk down the street and you're like, Oh, okay. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of in Europe with a little bit of an Asian thing going on here, you know? Hmm. So. That's fascinating. Yeah. So you're, you're very well-traveled, very, very diverse, and you've lived in Asia long enough to have a, a vast understanding of the difference in the culture between people who do live in Asia versus the American culture. So sure. can you tell us what you think the biggest difference is that you've seen between the two? Um. I think one thing that stands out to me right now, and I think it, it really has to do with like what's going on in the world right now um, this year, um, you know, with the virus in the U.S. and or, or all over anyways with this pandemic is one thing that's really different is I think in, in America and in the West, not just America, Canada, the U.K., uh, Australia, uh, different countries in Europe, et cetera, um, we, we kind of were more individualistic, whereas uh, in, in most Asian countries, um, they're very much more about the society as a whole. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's one reason why in, in some respects, um, in regards to this virus that's been going around, that the whole COVID thing is, is why Asia has kind of really gotten a little bit more further along on track than, than Europe has. Europe has blown up again with, with numbers and in, in, in the States as well. And I think it has to do with that fact of the fact about the whole society as a whole, where if, hmm. In Japan and China, if somebody's sick and they got a cold, um, you know, they'll automatically throw a mask on, you know, not so they don't get sick, but so that they don't sneeze or cough all over somebody while they're walking down down the street. I live in in the most uh, uh, population dense city in the world. And, um, you know, we've 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 weathered this storm really well with with with, um, COVID. So I think that stands out a lot to me, especially right now, is the fact that. um, you know, like I said, uh, Americans, uh, we're, we're more individuals and, and we kind of like we think about ourselves more and our families more. Whereas even though they do that here, it, it's the family, but then it's also their neighbor and then, you know, and, and then so on and so forth. 
that they kind of tend to take care of. Yeah, that's, that's something amazing to point out. And I have a super selfish question. Um, we hear a lot about this stigma of people blaming the virus on China. So can you tell me living, living in China, what, what that is like being received while living there? You know, I, I that's a good question. And, and I'm not sure I really have a great answer for you because being here, um, I'm not, and there is a difference between uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and mainland China. So the people are different. The way that the thinking is a little bit different than, than the mainland is, uh, which is right across the street from me. I can literally see mainland China from my window. Um, you, you know, I don't think, I haven't heard anybody say anything. Um, but everybody I talk to and everybody I hang out with, do they're either from the UK, Canada, or mm -hmm. I, I have very few... Um, if, if any Chinese friends here, which which is strange because when I lived in Japan, I had tons of Japanese friends, which was funny. But um, here, um, people tend to stick stick kind of closer together. The the expats stick together and stuff. Um, so I, I don't. I'm sorry. I, I can't really tell you what they what they feel about it. Um, I, I I can say that I, I do know that a lot of people within Hong Kong and Macau. I think, you know, they're very for the most part they're very suspicious of uh, of the virus in in certain ways and, and i don't mean from the fact that uh, it's a conspiracy theory but they're just you know it's there's a lot of questions and, and a lot of things that happened um initially back in january when this all started kicking off i was actually in taiwan at the time um in january when i really started to look at the numbers on this thing and started getting a little bit a little bit concerned that it was going to spread pretty quickly. And that's when I kind of started raising the flag, red flag to people back home and such. But um, yeah, great question. I, I don't have a very straightforward hmm. answer for you, unfortunately. Yeah, that's okay. Where are things right now with the virus and things opening or shutting down? Where are you at right now? Oh man, we're, we're at the movie theater just reopened finally um, uh, two, two weeks ago or something. I went to fall tenant. Um, schools are back. Um, you know, we're lucky for the, having the, the highest population density city in the world living here. We had zero, zero fatalities. And I believe we only had like 40 cases and they're all imported. Um, and uh, a lot of that is due to uh, a fast reaction on, on, mm. on the part of the Macau government over here. I can't say what they did over in mainland China. Um, but, and Hong Kong has struggled a lot more than we have, but Hong Kong is also a bit larger of a city and it, it's, you know, it's a little bit um, more international than we are. Um, so, but Hong Kong was also, also been reeling from protest and, and violence. So uh, ma massive gatherings, you know, we didn't have that here in Macau. So we didn't have that, that aspect of that close closeness to where you might spread the, spread the virus more. Um, hmm. So we've been, I mean, I, we've been really, really quite lucky out here. Um, um, so hopefully it will continue and, and um, things will get better around the world. Um, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see it's going to ebb and flow for a while. Um, unfortunately, just about everything that I predicted earlier on, um, I, I did a few podcasts months ago about the virus just um, specifically and and mostly everything that I said, what I thought would happen would, would happen. So, you know, it will get better. I think we just need to, you know, keep our heads up high and, and um you know, do our best and and um, be helpful to one another, and um, and um, and just uh, you know carry on with our life. It's not the end of the world. It's 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 not going to do us in. It it it, it is something to be uh, concerned about, um, but nothing to be overly concerned about. Um, you know, um, take precautions as necessary. Necessary. Wash your hands. It, 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 I say definitely wear a mask. I, I think um, I know there's a, a lot going on in America about masks right now and people are divided about, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask or you should wear a mask. And my, my thought is this. Uh, I know from personal spe speaking here, most people here wear masks, um, probably about 99 percent of the population. I don't I don't mind wearing a mask. It doesn't bother me when I go out. Um, I do understand why some people don't want to why they don't want to wear it. Um, but um, I, I think. Uh, the fact that we had zero deaths and only 40 cases here, um, in my opinion, I do believe that the masks do 
do help to um, help in prevention. It's not, it's not, it's not end all, end all be all thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, still, even if you have a mask on, you still could get it and you still could transmit it. But, um, you know, um, I, 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 I wear my mask for my, for my daughter because I got three year old, so I don't want her sick. So. Yeah. And I know a lot of us were seeking that normalcy. So with a lot of things going back and transitioning, you know, you said you're in the web and flow and it seems like right now you guys are in the flow. So what types of changes have you seen now that you can anticipate being permanent going forward because of the virus? Well, I think a uh, few things that are, I, I think drastically the whole landscape of everything we do is, is going to change. Um, it already has. Um, but uh, if, you know, from the American side of it, and being American, I, I, we'll get through it. Look at look what happened in nine 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 eleven. Things changed drastically after that, drastically. Now they become commonplace. Um, TSA, you know, was, was was the big thing that happened after that. And and we are going to have to do. You know, there's going to have to be uh, a really strong disease surveillance, uh, particularly focused on COVID uh, uh, COVID nineteen worldwide, um, and. Um, Life will go on. Um, travel will be more difficult, I think. I think, um, you know, uh, we may be required to uh, prove that we are negative of the virus if we want to travel, meaning we're going to have to get nasal swabs. Uh, here, everywhere I go, just about almost any place I go in, I've got to fill out a health declaration online and show it on my phone. It's annoying. Hmm. Um, they take temperature all the time anytime I go into a store here. Um which, you know, I have mixed feelings about both those things. But at the same time, um, you know, it. I, I guess that they, they feel that they're doing what they need to do. Um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting next few years. Um, I, I don't think we'll see the, the, the full scope of it until a few years of, of how the landscape is going to mm -hmm. really change. I, I say give it till 2023 at least to really figure out what's going to happen. Um, I have a, a really good friend who's a, who's a um, airline pilot here and he hasn't flown in 10 months. And so I get a lot of information from him and, and he's my workout buddy as well too. So I, so I ask him a lot, well, what do you think is going to change with as far as airline travel, et cetera. And he's given me a few, uh, a really good insight into that. And, and it's definitely, you know, uh, I would say um, look forward to getting nasal swab before you got an airplane, you know, <laughs> In, in your near future if you're wanting if you're wanting to travel yeah th thank you that's really insightful especially having gone through things that we haven't necessarily um all the way yet and i know you do photography you have amazing pictures up on your facebook profile so i'm wondering how you got into that in the first place um i've always been a big film guy uh, particularly I, I grew up a movie fanatic and and uh, my my sister, she probably drove her nuts. I'd watch films over and over and over again, a hundred times. And so I kind of developed my love of uh, film. I wanted to be a film uh, a filmmaker and a director and and whatnot. And then about twenty years ago, my dad got me a, a thirty five millimeter uh, Nikon, and so I started using that. And then um, later, I progressed to you know the digital SLRs. And and I just recently I got out of it for a while. I got out of photography for a good while. About I'd say. A, good good 10 years where i or i didn't shoot anything and i finally went and bought a new camera last um almost about a year ago and um just got back into it and um now i, I sell my photos and um i've got all my stuff up on instagram and facebook so um if anybody's interested in ever checking those out go go visit me on there and um yeah, it's kind of therapy for me. You know, I've, I, I've got PTSD from the war and um, uh, the best thing for PTSD, if anybody else out there is suffering from it for whatever reason, um, doesn't have to be war related. Um, you know, time has been very helpful to me. Time, time has healed a lot. Um, but you also you also got to have something to get up and do in the morning. Uh, you know, in, in photography is sometimes it's a struggle sometimes i don't want to go out sometimes i have to kick myself in the butt and say okay you got to go out and sometimes sometimes i don't but um you know with anything in life you just um take a break for a little while but get back on the horse eventually and um it's like i said therapy i enjoy it when when i'm out there and i'm looking at through the lens and i'm doing my photography it's just it's it's indescribable it's it, i i feel like i'm in control i feel um uh, at peace I feel kind of connected to, to whatever the subject is that I'm shooting that's beautiful that's that's really amazing and to to know how beautiful your is um 
And I have one more question before we wrap this up, but how can somebody contact you and take a look at your artwork and perhaps contact you further to be able to purchase something from you? Sure. Um, you can check. I've got a Facebook page. It's called Quinton J. Gray Photography. You can just go go add me there or um, add, add my name, Quinton Gray, on Facebook, and um, I'll probably invite you. And I also have in- Instagram. It's uh, Q-man, Q-M-A-N underscore U-S-N. You can follow me on there, and I post all my all my work there. It's, that's prim- my primary uh, gallery right there is, is Instagram. Awesome. Now, before this, you asked me if you can maybe know a little bit about some of these questions that I was going to ask you ahead of time. And I said no, because I like to keep things super organic. So I am going to throw you a curveball on purpose. Okay. So if you were to have a paid billboard in the most popular, influential place in the world, you can name something wherever that is, what would your billboard say? This is going to sound cheeky and corny, I think, because we hear it all the time, but I've just kind of, I, I really, in the past few months, I've really, it's really resonated with me how true it is. Live your life. It's really short, man. It's really short. Get the tattoo. Take the vacation. You know, uh, do whatever it is that you've been meaning to do forever. You know, just do it because eventually, you're not going to be able to, and it's going to be too late. Just do it. I, I, I know how cliche that sounds, and, and, but it's something that's really been kind of hitting with, with me lately a lot um, as I age. And I've, I've got a birthday next week, and you know I'm still young, but I'm I'll be 44, and and it just makes me think that like how quick this is going. So live live life, get the tattoo, you know. Don't hold on to hate. Uh, Love, do, be the best person you can and know that you're going to make mistakes, but just live life. Live your life. That's what I'd say. Beautiful. In the midst of this year, especially, I think that is an absolutely amazing way to end today's show. So I thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Have a really good day to everybody that is listening in and um, happy early birthday. Thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate it. I had a, had a blast. Me too. Have a really good night. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.